Good evening. Can you hear me okay? All right. I generally don't struggle with that, but I'm going to check just in case. Let's turn in our Bibles to John chapter uh, 14. We're going to be spending a great deal of time there. I am thankful for the opportunity to be here with you. Uh, this is, uh, Kelsey, my first time uh, coming out to Elk City, and thus our first time getting to be here and study and later worship with you. Uh, you'll notice we don't have our two boys, Shiloh and Shepard, with us. They are at Vacation Bible School with Mimi and Pops, Kelsey's parents tonight, uh, at Central and more. We do have uh, Lydia with us, and uh, she, she may or may not make her presence known. We'll, we'll see how well that works out. On cue, right on schedule. But we are glad to be here with you this evening. When I was growing up in the 90s, I was born in 91. When I was growing up in the 90s, uh, before going to elementary school and then when I started elementary school, there was a routine TV schedule that would happen. Power Rangers would come on uh, middle of the afternoon and then right after Power Rangers, it was no longer my turn to watch TV because Oprah was on and mom was gonna watch Oprah. And Oprah continued to grow in popularity and. Uh, people started to ask her some interesting questions because she's very influential and has been in some areas very helpful, but uh, perhaps theologically not as much as we would like. Um, at various points, she's been asked about her faith being as influential as she is, and at one point she started talking about how, well, there's really a million different ways to come to faith, a million different ways to come to the truth, a million different paths you can follow, that she was raised as uh, she was raised as a Baptist, but you know, she's gone her own way and there's really all these different ways and your way might just be as good as my way is, might be just as good as someone else's way is. And that's, that sounds nice and, and it's pleasant to hear and it doesn't really ruffle any feathers, but it's wrong. It's dead wrong. The Bible teaches that there is one way to truth, that there is one way to salvation that there is one way to God and in John 14 we read about this when Jesus in John chapter 14 in verse 6 says I am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the Father except through me this evening we're going to talk about that idea that he is the way, that he is the way to God, that he is the way to salvation, and that ultimately we're responsible for making his way our way. And so as we start, we're going to once again spend quite a bit of time in John chapter 14. Let's pick up by reading the greater context of what we just read at the beginning of the chapter. Let's pick up in verse 1 of John chapter 14. Jesus here says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on you do know him and have seen him. Now this is what we might call the farewell address that Jesus is giving. It'll go all the way through chapter 17 of the book of John. Uh, this is the last time he's able to sit down and have a, a lengthy conversation with his disciples and, and he's got a lot to tell them uh, about what life is going to be like after he's gone, what to expect, where he's going, what that means for them. Uh, later on, he'll pray what we call the high priestly prayer in chapter 17, that they may be one and even that we might be one just as he and the Father are one. And the one thing that comes up time and time again in this farewell address, as well as really in the book of John at large, is the idea of this relationship that Jesus has with the Father that there is this unique relationship that he and the Father share. Even just in chapter 4, or excuse me, 14 here, we see it come up time and time again. 
We've already read verses 1 through 7. Uh, look at verse 19. Jesus says, Yet a little while, and the world will uh, see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me. Skipping down to verse uh, 28. Excuse me, verse 28. You heard me say to you, I am going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And so you'll see here in John 14, he continues on explaining this relationship between himself and the Father. Uh, I want you to mark this chapter. We're going to come back to John 14. Let's go back to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. John chapter 8 really develops this idea quite a bit because he, he, he gets in, an, basically it's an argument uh, with the Jews, Jewish leaders, scribes, Pharisees, and the like, who have some questions for him. They, he's got quite a bit of notoriety amongst them at this point, and they, they're trying to grill him. They're trying to catch him, as they do really throughout the Gospels. Uh, but they're, they're asking him these various questions, and I want you to notice how he articulates this relationship he has with the Father. First, John chapter 8 and verse 19. John chapter 8 and verse 19. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you, neither know, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. They're going, where is your father? We know who your mother is, but where is your father? Later on, they will accuse him of being born uh, illegitimately. Uh, but he says here, if you knew me, you would know my Father also. To know me is to know the Father in heaven. Later on, down in verse 28, Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Speak just as the Father taught me. And so now it's not just, if you know me, you know the Father. It's, if you listen to me, you are now listening to the Father. You know me, you know the Father. If you listen to me, you listen to the Father. Skip down now to verse 38. He says, I speak of what I have seen with my Father, and you do what you have heard from your Father. He says here, if you know me, you know the Father. If you hear me speak, you hear the Father speak. And if you hear me speak, you now also see something of the Father. You see that experience through my words. Skip now down to verse 42. Jesus said to them, if God were your Father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Uh, the, the relationship between Jesus and God in the Gospel of John uh, uses the language of father and son, but it's, it's very closely cor correlated, if I can say the word correctly, uh, it's very closely correlated with the idea of a sender and the one who is sent with authority and instructions, that he is sent to do his father's bidding, that he has some responsibility, and it's not of his own accord. He's not doing it because he feels like doing it. He's not even doing it because he simply thinks it's best. He's doing it because it's what his father has told him to do. That if you want to know the Father, if you want to know his will for your, your life, you have to know Christ. You have to know Jesus. And then finally, skip all the way down to verse 54. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. We just cherry-picked a few verses out of one chapter of a book that deals largely with this subject, this relationship that Jesus has with God the Father. Now, you hear all these things. You hear all of these claims. How would you respond? It's rhetorical. How, how would you respond? Think for just a moment. Because we see how they responded. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus had hid himself and went out of the temple. He's claimed all of these, uh, he's claimed this special relationship with God the Father, this special relationship uh, with the one that the Jews claim to worship, the one they claim to follow, 
He's saying here, look, if you were really following him, if you really believed him, if you really trusted him, if you really put your faith in him, you would put your faith in me, you would believe me, you would trust me, you would listen to me. And they hear him make a claim to deity before Abraham was, I am. He is claiming to be God in this moment. And they're ready to stone him because they don't believe him, so he must be blaspheming. They don't believe him, so he must be blaspheming. How can we reconcile the idea of Jesus saying this with, with God accepting it, they ask. And they can't. Jesus makes it abundantly clear that if we're going to know God, and this is, you won't hear the phrase in our world today described as knowing God. You'll, you'll describe, hear it described as something like experience God. Right? If you want to experience God, you have to do this. Or you can go your own way and other people experience God their own way. Other people experience truth their own way. And Jesus makes it abundantly clear in the book of John. If you want to know God, you have to know him. You have to know him. He is the only way to God the Father, which brings us back to John 14. Here in John 14, Jesus is preparing them for his death. When he talks about going, he's talking about going to the cross. He's going to die. And because he's going to die on our behalf, there is room prepared for us. There is access to heaven because of what Jesus has done for us. And Thomas asks a question, Lord, we do not know the way to where you are going. How can we know the way? Or we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus makes it abundantly clear. He makes it as plain as can be. I am the way the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You might say, well, wait a second. This is a disciple now. We're not talking about just a random Jewish leader. This is a disciple. This is someone who spent significant time with Jesus. This is someone who you would expect to know Jesus, and yet he says here, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. He's saying here, there's another level of no that's important here. It's not just enough to acknowledge Jesus mentally. We live in a world where if people want to claim Jesus at all, that's about as far as they take it. Acknowledging him mentally. Yes, he is Jesus. Yes, he was special. He, uh, he was a prophet and a teacher. You may even have some uh, get to the point where they say, yes, he was and is the son of God. But Jesus is reaching even deeper than that. We'll talk about that just a little bit later on. But I want you to notice, first of all, that he makes it abundantly clear in the book of John, and we'll see elsewhere. But if you want to know God, if you want to reach God, if you want to experience God, if you want to have a relationship with God the Father, there is no way to do that outside of his Son, Jesus Christ. Secondly, if you want to be saved, there is no way for that to happen outside of Jesus Christ. To do this, we need to turn to Acts chapter 4. be in Acts chapter 4 for just a little bit. To bring you up to speed on what's going on in our passage, in Acts chapter uh, 3, they heal a lame beggar, I almost say beggar, beggar at the gate called Beautiful, uh, and the Jewish leaders, just as they were in Jesus' day, aren't having anything of it. They don't know what to do. There's been a miracle uh, that's taken place in a very public way in the name of Jesus Christ, but they can't wrap their mind about that being a around that being a real thing that's happened. And so they're trying to figure out how it is they're going to deal with that. And so in chapter 4, as a result of this miracle that's taken place, of this wonderful thing that's taken place, they go to court. Right? They would go to court for doing the right thing. They, they're put in front of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council in Acts chapter 4. And I want you to notice how this starts. Acts chapter 4, picking up in verse 1. It says, 
And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't help but read verse 2 of this passage and think not a lot has changed. What do you think happens when you go out into our world today and proclaim Jesus in the, within earshot of people who just don't want to hear it? They're greatly annoyed, aren't they? And that might be putting it charitably. In our country, in our society here in America, it might just get to the point of greatly annoyed. In, um, in other parts of the world, the people who proclaim Jesus are threatened with their lives as a result of making these proclamations. And in fact, it's very likely that the only reason Peter and John aren't being threatened with their lives on this particular occasion is that the miracle is undeniable in the sight of many people. It'll cause an uproar if they execute Peter and John over this. They're greatly annoyed. Let's continue reading on. Let's pick up in verse 5. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under, wit, under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now Peter is full of the Holy Spirit when he utters these words. That being said, he does something that preachers have a tendency to do. He's given an opportunity to speak, so he preaches, doesn't he? And so there's a question asked. How did this happen? By what means was this man healed? And it may have been just enough to simply say, in the name, or that functionally means by the power of Jesus Christ, that same Jesus of Nazareth. But he goes several steps beyond that, doesn't he? He says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, in the middle of verse 10. He could have ended it there. He doesn't. Whom you crucified. You killed that guy, remember? You put him on a cross. Sounds a lot like what he says two chapters earlier. The day of Pentecost. This Jesus whom you crucified, God has raised up, Peter said in chapter 2. But he says, this Jesus whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. And that might have been enough in that moment, right? So we're not confused about which Jesus, it's the one you killed. That might have been enough. Then we get to verse 11. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So he's making sure they know they've rejected him two different ways. He's the cornerstone at this point. They thought they were builders. They're supposed to be the one showing God to other people. That's what Israel was designed to do as a nation, was to basically reveal God to the rest of the world. And, well, the builders have rejected the cornerstone. And as if that's not enough, we get to verse 12. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which... We must be saved. Every, almost every religious figure who has ever lived, at least at some point, strives to wrestle with the question, how am I saved? We sometimes have phrased it, what must I do to be saved? 
What is necessary? What's the way to salvation? And Peter here makes it clear. There's no alternative. None. Brothers and sisters, we need to be sure we understand that when we preach this message in our world today, it is a counter-cultural message. The majority of the people who hear this are going to reject it. Because, well, that might be your truth, but it's not mine. That might be what you believe, and that might be what you practice, but that's not what I believe, and that's not what I practice. And who's to say you're any more right than I am? And if it were left up to us, if there were no authority behind the message, there'd be some truth to that. But Peter here is inspired of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, as he teaches and as he shows what it means to know God, he's simply doing that on God's own authority. The inspired writers we read in Scripture who tell us how to live, who give us commands uh, to follow, what it means to live a godly life. They're not doing so on their own authority. They're doing so as the Holy Spirit has carried them along. You need to understand that this message, that there's only one way to salvation, is a counter-cultural message that the world does not want to hear, but that the world desperately needs to hear. that there's only one way to salvation. And that makes sense, given what we've already studied, right? There's only one way to the Father. There's only one way to salvation. Those, those things should line up. Sometimes, if we're not careful, we will... Uh, we don't ever reject this idea as Christians, I think, on, a large, on the largest possible level. At least the majority of us don't. I think where we run into trouble is when we start uh, with individual commands. You know, that I can live this particular way, and if someone has a different belief about a piece of doctrine as presented in Scripture, that, that's where... A, a, you know, it's, it's okay. They, they can do that. They go to that church over there, and they're, they're fine over there, and we're fine over here. And it's just a light form of denominationalism at that point. When Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and when Peter says, there's not salvation by any other name, it's not just simply that Jesus is the only way to salvation. But from that come his teachings, his example, the teachings of the inspired writers, and, and much more. That there's a way of life associated with that. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. While you're turning there, bring up another little bit of nostalgia. Back in the mid to late 90s, maybe earlier, I don't know, I was too young to remember then, but back in the mid to late 90s, I remember those, uh, those bracelets, those WWJD bracelets. You remember those? Maybe, maybe not. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus do? Now, I understand that there are risks with uh, commercializing um, Jesus to the point where probably some of the people who were wearing those things uh, were not taking it as seriously as they could. That, that's fair to say. But the sentiment behind it is absolutely appropriate. Is one of the things we understand from Scripture, and we're going to take a look at right now, is the idea that our life is to be lived according to the standard that Jesus has set for us, that we follow his example and we follow his teachings so that we live as Jesus lived. We could look at many passages to uh, show us this. I think Philippians chapter 2 proves most helpful. Let's get the context. Philippians chapter 2 verses uh, 1 through 4. Paul writes, 
So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection uh, and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count, each, count others more significant than yourself. And so, to be clear, in context here, Philippians is talking about our relationships with other people. He's talking about, perhaps primarily, our relationships with fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But he's talking about our relationships with other people, right? Be of the same mind, have the same love, uh, being in full accord and of one mind. Don't be selfish. Be humble. Count others more significant than yourselves. Look to the interests of others. And then he immediately immediately once he gets done listing these things turns to Christ verse 5 have this mind among yourselves which is yours in Christ Jesus saying Jesus set this example for you and here's what it looks like verse 6 who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want you to notice two things in particular about this. The first is the presumption and it is a presumption in this passage that Jesus example is authoritative that if he did it if he had this mindset then we as his followers are expected to also have that mindset there's no debate Paul doesn't have to argue that particular point he explains what that mindset is and we'll get to that in just a moment but he doesn't have to sit here and argue that Jesus is authoritative for Christians in a way that nothing and no one else is. But notice the extreme nature of the mindset. So where does he start? He starts in heaven, right? Verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not, account, or did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Okay. Emptied himself of selfish ambition of selfish desire not that Jesus was sinfully selfish we understand but that he becomes humble right verse 7 he takes the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men okay we're we're, we're not in the form of God right we're all of a sudden now taking on the likeness of men doesn't mean that Jesus was not God it just shows that he's condescending he's condescending he's not just a man he's a servant Verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. And he doesn't just die any death, he dies arguably the most heinous death that any person could possibly experience, that of crucifixion. We don't have time, and frankly tonight I really don't have the stomach to go into details about what all is involved in that death, but Paul is stressing he doesn't just die an ordinary death. He doesn't just live out his life and then die, but he dies an excruciatingly painful death. And he does so for our sake. The whole thrust of the passage is when you consider your humility, your relationship with others, Jesus is your example, and he was willing to die for us. That's the example. That's the standard. Is it a high standard? Absolutely. But we're not called to anything less. We're not called to excuse ourselves when it becomes a little too painful. We're not called to step back and reevaluate if this is what we really want to do when it becomes inconvenient. See, ultimately, this idea that gets uh, purported in our world today of, well, your truth might not be my truth, might not be anyone else's truth, might be someone else's You know, we, we all have our different truths and our different ways to God. Ultimately, that exists because when you confront 
Jesus, when you confront his plan for your life and it conflicts with what you think you should be doing or perhaps more honestly what you would like to be doing in this life, you have a decision to make. Are you going to choose your convenience and your pleasure? Are you going to choose to do the things that you would like to do and try and rationalize them some other way? Or are you going to conform to the standard that Jesus has set for you? You have a choice. Let's hop over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Before we dive into the text, the first 11 chapters of Romans are theology. They're Christology. Here's, uh, here's what Jesus means for the relationship God has with the Jews. Here's what Jesus means for the Gentiles. Uh, and ultimately, it's neither one really has an advantage. We're all one in Christ. Here's what Jesus means for our salvation. He, he presumes that the church has been baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and that they need to be reminded of that in Romans chapter 6, verses 1 and following. Chapter 7, he talks about his struggle with sin, that just because you are a Christian does not mean that you are totally absolved of temptation. In fact, uh, there's an argument to be made that it ramps up considerably once you become a Christian because you become aware of your sinfulness in a particular way. Chapter 8 talks about the relationship of the Holy Spirit uh, with us in our lives. There's much disagreement over what's going on exactly there, but it talks about the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives. And chapters 9 through 11 talks about God's uh, scheme of redemption, we might say, that God had this plan uh, for people to be saved. And then we hit chapter 12, and we finally hit what we might call the application part of the letter. And after all of this, Paul says in verse 1, I therefore appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be confused form to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect your translation instead of spiritual worship may say something like reasonable service or it may say something like reasonable service of worship depending on your translation what's he saying he's saying you need to be mindful about how you present yourself to God and if your standard is a worldly one you can guarantee in that moment that you're not presenting an acceptable sacrifice. If you're conforming to the world, and the world isn't some nebulous concept here, if you're conforming to your desires or what other people think you should be doing, you're going to fall short. But if we're going to acknowledge that Jesus is the way and if we're going to live like it, it requires the second part of verse 2. We have to be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We have to view everyone and everything differently. We have to view everyone and everything differently. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He talks about how we used to view people according to the flesh, but because of Jesus, we don't view them that way anymore. We have a different perspective. We have a different mindset. And if we're going to live the way that God has called us to live, it's going to require some changes. We live in a world where making these changes is countercultural. I hear more and more Older Christians talk about how they never anticipated we would struggle with some of the sins that we struggle with in our country today. And it makes me wonder when I get to be of that age what I'll be saying that about. Verse 
what sorts of changes will be taking place in society. I would like to think that in those moments, people uh, generally might be characterized as being closer to God in those moments. But in times as such as we live now, I, I often find myself being pessimistic about that. Thankfully, I don't have to worry about conforming to those standards. I have a standard given to us in Scripture that is timeless. As countercultural as it might be now, it is the truth. It is the way to God. I don't have to worry about trying to conform to this standard and, and 10 years later trying to conform to another one and 10 years later trying to say something else is okay and say something else is okay and trying to figure out this and that. I have it right here. I have the way to God right here, presented in Scripture in Christ Jesus. Thus, we have the way to salvation as well. We talked about how uh, Romans chapter 6 mentions baptism. It talks about the presumption that those who have been baptized have been baptized into the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Peter, in that sermon we mentioned in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, talks about how salvation is for the forgiveness of sins. Baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus himself commands his disciples in Matthew chapter 28 that they're to go and teach baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit in the name of, by the power of, that same power that healed that lame beggar in chapter 3 is what saves you and me from our sins today. As we go throughout the rest of this week, I'll challenge you simply to do one thing. Consider whether you're living like it. I don't think anyone came to services tonight. I don't know. I, this is my first time here. I don't know for sure. But I don't think anyone came to services here tonight expecting to stand up and say, I do not believe. I think there are all sorts of ways. I think the vast majority of us, when I say that, or when I quote scripture, that Jesus is the way, that Jesus himself said that, I am the way. I don't think any of us are going to sit there and say, he's wrong. I think the problem is we struggle to live like it. We get distracted by worldly pursuits. We get distracted by convenience. We get distracted by whatever it is we want to do when it becomes at odds with what Jesus wants us to do. Five minutes. We become distracted. And we start to move further away from God in those moments. Further away from his will for our lives. And it compounds and it snowballs and it snowballs to the point where we wake up one morning and find ourselves not even close to where we used to be. When you make the claim that Jesus is Lord, there's a certain way of life that accompanies that if that claims to be believed. If we're not careful, we find ourselves moving further and further and further away from that. And if you wake up one morning and you find yourself far away from God because of choices you've made, ask yourself one simple question. Who moved? Because it wasn't God. God bless you. Go with God. Thank you. was one. Good evening. There we go. Uh, Exodus chapter 3. Uh, we'll be there here in just a moment. I got pointed at, so I reckon it's time to get started with our devotional. We spent some time talking about uh, Jesus being the way, and uh, at the end of our lesson, we talked about how that way means living a particular way of life, uh, living, a, living according to a particular plan. And sometimes we have questions about that plan. We have questions about what God wants us to do. Um, I can't help but think of Moses here in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, who has some questions about what God wants him to do. You'll remember that Moses in Exodus chapters 1 and 2 is born, 
He, is, he grows up in the Egyptian royal household, and eventually he strikes down an Egyptian. Word gets out, and he rightfully flees for his life. He's concerned that Pharaoh is going to kill him, and we read in the text that Pharaoh indeed seeks to kill Moses. And so he goes to Midian, and after about 40 years in Midian, he has this encounter at the burning bush. And verse 2, I want you to notice of chapter 3 as we start. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take, off, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their suffering, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of, the land, out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now... Behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. In a nutshell, I have heard my people cry out. They're enslaved, and I'm going to lead them out of Egypt by your hand. You're going to go back to Pharaoh. Last time we talked about Pharaoh, Pharaoh sought to kill him. And you're going to go back. And so, understandably, Moses has some questions. He has some concerns. I think that's fair to say. Moses said to God, verse 11, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children out of Egypt? First question, who am I? And how does God respond? Does the text here say, I told you to go. It's time to go. Why aren't you listening? Does the text say the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses? No, it does not. God answers the question. Skip down to verse 13. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? He has another question. And God says here, look, I've already answered one question. Can we just go? Can you just have some faith? No, he doesn't say that, does he? Does the text say that the Lord is angry with Moses? No. God answers the question. Now skip over to chapter 4 and verse 1. Then Moses answered, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. First question, who am I? Second question, who are you? Third concern, what if they don't believe me? They're not going to believe me. And verse 2 does not say, you'll notice once again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. It simply says, well, it says a lot, doesn't it? There's a lot of signs that the Lord does to reassure Moses that he's got this cover. He knows what his plan is about. He knows it's going to succeed. Skip down to verse 10. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to our servant, but I am slow of speech and tongue. Now, here Moses is probably over-exaggerating this point. Um, Acts chapter 7 and verse 22, the last sermon that Stephen preaches, uh, and eventually he'll be stoned to death as he is preaching, he notes in that verse that Moses is mighty of words and deeds. Mo Moses knows how to speak. What Moses is saying here is, my speaking is not really up to this, this task. I'm not really up to this. And the next verse you'll notice once more, for a fourth time, does not say, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. It suggests that God takes these concerns seriously. He answers each and every single one. This one in particular, he says, I made your mouth, I know what it can do. Finally, we get to verse 13. But he said, oh my Lord, please send someone else. Functionally saying here, I don't want to go. Please 
send someone else. Then, in verse 14, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. What's the lesson? When we read about what it means for Jesus to be the way in our lives, the way to God, the way to salvation, and when we, meet, when we read about what changes we have to make in our lives to conform to that way, we're going to have questions. Just as Moses had questions about God's plan for his life, so too do we have questions about God's plan for ours. Sometimes those decisions, so those changes we need to make, are going to come at great personal cost to us. I'm not going to survey the room at this moment, but my guess is that there are at least some in this room who have lost perhaps even family members close friends and loved ones, lost relationships with those people because of your faith in Christ, because of the decision you've made to live a particular way, because of the decision you've made to not invite sin into your life and the lives of your family members. Sometimes the cost causes us to reevaluate that plan. And when we have questions about that, when we have concerns we're encouraged to bring those to God. God does not rebuke Moses for having concerns. He answers them. He doesn't rebuke us for having concerns. He answers them. It's only when we decide, I don't want to do that, that the Lord's anger is kindled against us. It's only when we decide, someone else is better suited for this or I'm not really up to making this change or, or, or carrying out this task or doing what you've told me to do that's when we run into trouble that's when the Lord becomes angry with us as he should be with Moses' plan this, this will be our last point with, with Moses' plan with the plan that God has for Moses he's called him to do a great task but one of the things you see throughout the text, and we didn't have time to read all of it, but you see throughout the text, and even in the 40 years of Midian before, and even in the 40 years uh, in Egypt before, is that God has prepared Moses for this task. Another way of saying that is he's given Moses everything he needs to do what he has told him to do. And the same is true for us today. If God has called us to do something, if he's called us to take on a work, if he's called us to make changes in our lives, if he's called us to do various things, even if they're at great personal cost to us in some way, then he has given us everything we need to be sure we can make those changes. He does not tell us to do something and not give us the means to do it. And so maybe it is this evening you're struggling with God's plan for your life. Maybe it is you're struggling with conforming to the image of his son struggling to be like Jesus. That you recognize this evening your need as a Christian to address that sin in your life, that shortcoming in your life. We'd love to pray with you and we'd love to pray for you. Maybe it is you're not a Christian. You've not conformed to that image, being baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the forgiveness of your sins. We would love to assist you if you're prepared. If you have any need, please come forward as we now stand and sing.